Jeffrey Kahn is a professor of law at Southern Methodist University. He just participated in a Wilson Center conference, Protecting Civil Liberties and the Rule of Law in the Age of Terrorism. He joins us to discuss the topic. Jeffrey, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So we've had this perfect storm since 9-11 of, of terrorist threats and fears and, and, and the responding through nationalistic tendencies. It almost seems like a bad place for civil, liberty, civil liberties to live. Is, is it as bad as it might appear when you look at the superficial indicators? Well, I, I suppose another way of asking the question is, are civil liberties in retreat? And that really depends on what your starting point is. I teach students now at the law school who were eight or nine on September 11th. Mm -hmm. So for them, the world we're living in is normal, a world where uh, there are some pretty substantial accusations of mass surveillance uh, by, our, by our own government, where terrorist watch lists can deprive an individual of rights without any sort of a judicial process or conviction of a crime or, or other third-party neutral magistrate making a decision. But for them, this is just the world they were born into. Uh, for those who remember the world we had before 9-11, I think that uh, we'd all agree that there's been a dramatic departure from the civil liberties we used to think the Constitution enshrined. So would it be fair then, based on that assessment, that to characterize these young people you deal with as more willing to surrender a certain amount of civil liberties in the pursuit of security? Well, I'm not really sure that they would think of it as surrender because they have never they had. Think of it that way, they but... wouldn't think of it that way. Uh, however, I'm I'm optimistic because when in class we drill down on just what they think their rights are, mm -hmm. uh, what you usually find out is they were not really fully aware of what the programs and policies and laws are that restructured their world. And once they're aware. They're very concerned. And that's a problem that we discussed at the conference just a few minutes ago. We have uh, a very dangerous uh, sort of um, uh, force, two forces moving together. One is we have an extremely powerful government uh, that is full of well-meaning, hardworking, dedicated uh, men and women, uh, but who have a tremendous amount of power. Uh, and we have, on the other hand, uh, a citizenry who uh, equally well-meaning and, and proud and, uh, and, and uh, in a way maybe a little too trusting of their government, not always aware of just how much power there is and how easily it is to turn that power in their direction as opposed to what many Americans I think presume wrongly that the threat is outside the United States. So as, as you were describing what you just did, I kept thinking of the whole balance. I kept seeing the fulcrum as you were talking. In that regard, in balancing these two concerns, how is the U.S. doing? Well, we still are the world leader in civil liberties and the rule of law. The very fact we could have this discussion is evidence of that. In the world that I inhabit and the research that I do on terrorist watch lists, I'm very proud to know and to participate in a robust tradition of litigation and access to courts where grievances that individuals have can be aired. On the other hand, the sort of injuries that individuals are now claiming about government abuse of these watch lists and the lack of restraint in using these watch lists are a source of real concern for me. How do we compare globally? With regard to watch lists, we're the world leader. We've invented the idea. But the funny thing is, we took an old word and we imbued it with new meaning. It's not as if watch lists didn't exist before September 11th. I mean, Casablanca is built on the idea that Captain Renault would say, round up the usual suspects. Uh -huh. And any policeman would tell you that, of course, to know your neighborhood means to have a list in your head of who to watch. But before 9-11, when watch lists really just meant a list of people to watch, to move that from a watch list to an action list required moving the decision maker from exclusively the executive to the executive checked by a judiciary, often in a criminal courtroom. From evidence that was based on propensity and future dangerousness to evidence of some past wrongful act that was committed. And from decision making that was done entirely in secret, there's no reason why composing a list has to be a public affair. But using the list used to be something that could be judged in a public forum, typically a courtroom. When we use this old word watch list and we now imbue it with the new meaning of the no-fly list and other terrorist watch lists, 
we've crossed that border and we're not using those same structural protections for rights. Is there a way to not uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak? In, uh, in other words, can you orchestrate these types of things in a less intrusive manner, in a more transparent manner? Absolutely. Part of the reason they have been so intrusive and aggressive is because of the horror of 9-11. Anybody who remembers that day and anybody who was alive and older than 10, I'd say, certainly remembers that day, knows the horror of September 11th and would do anything to stop that from happening again. The problem is that the power of watch lists is so expansive and when these traditional borders of, of magistrates and publicity and, and the right sort of evidence are removed, the opportunity for expansion is irresistible. And that's, and that's just what has happened. On the other hand, those who have been injured by these watch lists and have had the courage, and I'd also say the resources, to complain in a court of law have been the strongest check and push back against the federal government. And they have returned some measure of notice and accountability, but they're going at baby steps. It's a very slow process. It's a very expensive process. And it shouldn't, in our established rule of law democracy, be borne on the shoulders of just a few. What do the trend lines indicate in this regard? Is this a battle that is here to stay for the long term, or do you see the tide turning and civil libertarians more, more or less reasserting themselves in this equation? Well, there is a theory that when our pendulum uh, swings away from civil liberties because of some serious threat, eventually it will swing back. I'm of the view that it doesn't necessarily always swing back to quite the same place. On the other hand, I'm optimistic because I know from past research in a book that I wrote that we were through something like the terrorist watch list system before. It's just we didn't have the massive computerized digital databases that we this? can put to use uh, today. That was in the 1950s. I wrote a book about the head of the passport agency at the State Department, a woman named Ruth Shipley. And the book is called Mrs. Shipley's Ghost, The Right to Travel and Terrorist Watch Lists. And it's about a world where she controlled access to passports. Mm -hmm. And if in the world, words of the day you were too dangerous to travel or not, your travel was not in the interest of the United States government, you just didn't travel. Now in those days, we knew it was Mrs. Shipley doing it. We knew where to find her. She was at the Winder building across from the old executive office building, and you could go talk to her. She never on record changed her mind, at least my research at the National Archives told me that. But eventually, there was enough litigation from people who were wrongly, and, and I'd say anybody who was told by Mrs. Shipley, you cannot travel, and she's the stop of that conversation. They were all wrongly told that. But eventually, the court snapped out of the anxieties of the Red Scare and undid her system. They undid it by demanding accountability, notice, and a chance to be heard. And my theory is the pendulum is not going to swing all the way back. But we do see signs in some pretty tremendous litigation efforts, most notably in a case called Latif uh, that is being uh, litigated now in Oregon, has been litigated for the last six or eight years, uh, in which those plaintiffs have won a measure more of notice and a chance to be heard to get some information back from the government about why they should be put on this list. But as I said, these are very small baby steps. And although I'm hopeful that Mrs. Shipley's recreated world will be destroyed again. Mrs. Shipley on steroids and we don't know her name this time around. Well, Maybe there's another book in there. There may be, but <laughs> she's been distributed across a wide array of many different analysts, each of whom have got just a little piece of this puzzle. So nobody has a final say. And tech tools she couldn't dream of in the 1950s. Exactly. Now, that has some advantages in terms of developing these watch lists, but it all it also tends to erode accountability, a sense of responsibility, and we need the protections of our courts and our rule of law constitutional system just as much today as we did then. Jeffrey Kahn, thank you. Uh, the uh, price of liberty, eternal vigilance. Thank you. Thanks.